I want to divide my comments really into four parts. The first part is trying to address this sort of conundrum, uh, if it is a conundrum, of uh, how can a religion like Buddhism, if we see it or construct it as being an otherworldly mysticism, what is its practical relevance to economics? Uh, and I'll be using a lot of visual images to suggest that. Uh, the second part of my remarks, again using many visual images, will be looking at uh, three different institutional responses, if you will, to the modern economic transformation that has taken place globally, but particularly in terms of Thailand. How does traditional Buddhism or Buddhist institutions uh, respond, or how have they responded, or how might they respond? So that's a kind of, if you will, anthropological case study. Then I want to look at some textual material written primarily by Buddhists, uh, uh, practitioners, some scholars, uh, who have written about uh, Buddhist, Buddhism and the economy, or Buddhist economics, or if you will, Buddhist economic ethics. And then I want to close with some remarks about a philosophy which has a general association with Buddhism in Thailand, uh, attributed initially to uh, the king of Thailand, and that is known as the sufficiency economy. The shadow of Max Weber's characterization of early Indian Buddhism as an expression of other worldly mysticism type of religion continues, as I suggested, I think, to shape the popular mind in regard to Buddhism. Consequently, the picture of Thich Quang Duc's self-immolation during the Vietnam War, or more recently, Burmese monks protesting the ruling junta in front of the Shwedagon in Yangon, are interpreted as political actions rather than religious actions. After all, doesn't the Buddhist monk dedicate himself to the pursuit of nirvana, the practice of meditation, the study of scholarly texts? While such a view of Buddhism may be a reasonable representation of an ideal type, it's never corresponded to historical reality. Buddhism, like other historical religious traditions, is after all embedded in particular contexts, in particular times, in particular places. Buddhism then, as a historically conditioned and culturally embedded tradition, should be seen in the plural, not in the singular. It is Buddhisms, not Buddhism. And the same would hold true for any great religious tradition. As a historically conditioned and culturally embedded tradition, Buddhism addresses a wide range, therefore, of human issues and problems, while at the same time, to be sure, it relates the human condition to universal principles and ultimate goals. The Buddhist dharma, that is to say, Buddhist teachings, Buddhist truth, charts a path to the resolution of the problematic of human suffering. It does indeed. But at the same time, it, ha it does and has offered practical advice to kings, to fathers, to wives, to children. Contemporary Buddhists often look to their textual traditions, the Dharma, to formulate a wide range of social ethics relevant to the major issues of our day, be they political, economic, biomedical, environmental. There's an extensive literature on all of these subjects. In the course of my remarks this evening, I'll be mentioning two narrative texts in the Pali Theravada tradition in which I work that are referenced by contemporary Buddhists in their construction of an economic ethic. Now, having said that, then I want to make a, an observation of caution, if you will. There is no single Buddhist economic ethic, just as Buddhism itself is not monolithic. And secondly, Crafting an ethic relevant to contemporary issues, whatever the issue may be, from text written in times and places vastly different from our own, has, I think it would be obvious to you, a built-in problematic. To use an example from politics, in what sense can early Buddhist teachings regarding, regarding kingship or the paradigmatic Indian Buddhist ruler, King Ashoka, to what extent can these examples be applied to the politics of modern nation states, as some Buddhists do. 
Now, I don't mean to imply that classical teachings from Buddhism or other religion, world religions, for that matter, are completely bound to time and place. They're not. However, their historical relativity cautions against easy generalizations about their relevance to today's contentious issues and problems. This is the part of the world in which I do a great deal of my work. This is Chiang Mai, Thailand, and we're looking down from one of the mountains that rings the Chiang Mai Valley, and we get some idea of what the topography looks like. We're looking at the city of, of Chiang Mai. This is a very rich plain. Uh, it's a major rice-producing area for uh, the northern part of the country, as we will see. Many of my slides, and let me make clear that I'm trying to draw a very sharp contrast between a more traditional lifestyle uh, and the impact that modernity and modern economic developments have had on traditional Thai life and traditional Buddhist institutions. So this is a rural scene, obviously, a quite pastoral and bucolic scene, I think you would agree, looking toward one of the major mountains uh, that ring the city of Chiang Mai. This is Doi Sutep Mountain. If any of you have visited Chiang Mai, you know this is a very important site and a very sacred site because there's an important Buddhist monastery on the top. Rice production, uh, traditionally uh, the major economic uh, enterprise of most Thais. I'm going to let this these uh, photographs, in part, speak for themselves. Transporting coconuts on one of the kalongs, or canals, in central Thailand. Uh, net fishing in one of those kalongs, in one of those canals. And it was in this kind of pastoral, rural life that, of course, Buddhist institutions, Buddhist monasteries, Buddhist temples, uh, this was the place they occupied. So here's one, here's another. Uh, a village, a very crude village house. Uh, actually, this is now on the campus of Chiang Mai University. It would be hard to find a house like this now in northern Thailand. So, quite a contrast between that hut, if you will, and the kind of modern housing developments that we find all over Thailand. The happy family. Uh, nuclear family, very different from the extended families that typified Thailand. Or moving to major, uh, Bangkok, where we have these major high-rise condominiums and office buildings. Obviously, there are still traditional markets. And these traditional markets compete with commodities like this. Duty-free shops in the Bangkok airport. So obviously the impact of uh, modernity, of modern economics developments, of social change, of cultural change has uh, taken place quite rapidly. And the changes have been very profound. And the impacts have been various, as these uh, shots that I took of newspapers, Thai newspapers, indicate. But our concern then is with Buddhism. And traditional Buddhist practice, this is a, a very famous Thai monk, now deceased, uh, very well known as a meditating monk uh, who uh, had achieved higher states of consciousness. Um, as a consequence, uh, many families would bring their young uh, men, their, their children, uh, to ordain as monks uh, with him. Uh, so they would come under his, uh, his influence and his training. Um, so meditation, holy monks, uh, a forest monk, as he was. Um, monks going out in the morning on their bindabata rounds or their alms rounds. The relationship between laity and monks in a country like Thailand is a, a very interdependent one. Uh, lay people give monks gifts of material gifts, gifts of food. So every morning you would see monks on their alms rounds, their bindabata rounds, receiving food from men like this, while they then in return gave the gift of the Dharma, gave the gift of teaching. It ain't McDonald's. 
uh, traditional chanting ceremonies which punctuated the uh, monastic life. Uh, the monastic day began with chanting ceremonies like this and ended with ceremonies like this. So in terms of this kind of dramatic economic, social, and cultural change, uh, what role does Buddhism play or can it play in an economic sense or in other ways as well. This is a forest monastery in northern Thailand where I spent a, quite a bit of time, founded by, again, a very famous meditating forest monk. Well, I want now to use visual images to talk about three institutional responses. This is a monk who uh, sees the opportunity of dramatic economic and social change in Thailand to try to use his monastery as a center to address problems that particularly young people were facing. He was the abbot of a major urban monastery in Chiang Mai. Uh, as a symbolic act, uh, he established a new monastery outside of Chiang Mai uh, on a crematory grounds. This is unheard of because crematory grounds, as we know, of course, are uh, infested with ghosts. So for a monk to build a monastery on a crematory ground is quite remarkable. Uh, here we have a uh, guthi, a monastic dwelling. Uh, all the trees he planted had some medicinal or, uh, or, or, or were fruit trees. So here are fruit trees that uh, uh, a young novice monk is cleaning out from under. Uh, this is uh, an image hall, a wihan. Uh, at his monastery, uh, the name of which is Wat Ba Dara Pi Rome. So on his temple grounds then, uh, he established uh, what he came to call a foundation for education and development of rural areas. He founded it in 1974, and by 1996, FEDRA had sponsored projects in 89 villages and three provinces that included rice, water buffalo, and cattle banks, a credit unions, co-ops, and educational projects to train village youth in modern agricultural techniques and marketable vocational skills. Uh, he recruited volunteers, a kind of like a Peace Corps, if you will, the domestic Peace Corps, uh, to work uh, in the office that, the, uh, that oversaw these kinds of developments. Some of the vocational skills that they taught were um, the use of uh, mulberry paper, uh, uh, developing products from mulberry paper, whether they're uh, photo albums or uh, all kinds of uh, uh, artifacts and books that were done from mulberry paper. Weaving. Uh, this is a young girl using a backstrap. So that's one response. Uh, the response of uh, Lung Po Chan. Uh, to the kind of economic challenges and social challenges that he felt young village, uh, young men and women were facing. A very different response is represented by this slide. A uh, new religious movement in Thailand, Wat Tamakai, headquartered uh, at Putum Thani outside of Bangkok. Uh, it very much embraced the commodification of Thai culture. Uh, it sometimes ref had been referred to as a religious consumerism. Uh, it very much emphasized the development of uh, these mass uh, organizational uh, events, uh, festivals uh, that punctuated uh, the academic or the, uh, the religious calendar for the year. Uh, here we have a good representation of this, uh, this magnificent temple in the background, uh, monks in the foreground, lay people dressed in white in the back. Uh, this is the image inside their temple. Very unusual. Uh, if you know anything about Thai images, this does not look like a Thai image. Uh, this is referred to uh, as a Sakon image, as a universal image. There's a sense uh, in which it is a Buddha uni uh, an image that fits into, it's, it's a globalized image, uh, as there's a sense in which Tamakai fits into a globalized economy in Thailand. Uh, the use of uh, interesting meditation techniques, uh, sort of universalizing a practice that was associated primarily with monks, again, part of the mass rituals and ceremonies that one finds uh, at the 
Putum Thani Tamakai Center. The participation of high government officials, uh, again, uh, part of the way in which this particular religious movement configured itself. The appropriation, again, of uh, a meditation practice that was associated primarily with forest monks, the kind of, if you will, globalization of or the domestication of this kind of religious practice. As I say, this particular kind of response, if you will, or movement or development uh, has been characterized by some critics as religious consumerism. Uh, Sunitsuda Ekachai, who is a major editorial writer for one of the English language newspapers in Thailand, the Bangkok Post, has characterized it this way. Urban Thai society rule, ru ruled by consumer culture uh, and the Namakaya movement by integrating capitalism into its structure has become popular with contemporary urban ties who equate efficiency, orderliness, clean, cleanliness, elegance, grandeur, spectacle, and material success with goodness. Dhammakai then could be viewed as a capitalist version of Buddhism aimed at urban ties who are used to comfort, convenience, and the instant gratification found in consumer society. So two different responses or two different developments of institutional Buddhism in Thailand in response to the modern economic, social, uh, changes in Thailand. A third and radically different response is one that rather than embracing religious consumerism or the commodification of Thai culture, rejects it. Uh, it is a small movement, uh, not surprisingly, the Santi Asok movement. Uh, this was one of their centers uh, that was founded early on in the early 70s, uh, out not, not so far outside of, of Bangkok at Nakapatom. The founder's name was Prap Bodhi Rak. Uh, Contrast this in your minds with the Dhammakai movement. Uh, it is night and day. Uh, whereas Dhammakai embraces the kind of globalized uh, globalization of Thai culture, if you will, uh, the Thai economy, Thai society, uh, Santya Sok rejects and stands at the margin. It embraces vegetarianism. Uh, here is a vegetarian store at one of their centers. It's very critical of violence in Thai society, for it equates violence with consumerism, with globalization. Uh, Thai boxing, uh, these again are shots I took of newspapers. Critique of consumerism, critique of nightclub culture. Uh, they are vegetarians. Um, so again, three different responses to the kinds of dramatic changes uh, that have taken place uh, in Thailand especially with an economic, uh, very, very strong economic dimension. Again, uh, referring to an article written by Sunitsuda Ekachai about this movement. What Bodhi Rock has done is offer dissatisfied Buddhists an alternative. In contrast to mainstream monks, Santi Asok disciples follow strict moral discipline, eating only one vegetarian meal a day, and living a Spartan life. They also reject object worship, and Buddhism by clergy. While the feudalistic clergy has lost touch with the world, Santi Asok effectively attracts those disillusioned with materialism by, let me go back, by offering them a sense of mission and belonging to a close-knit community. So, uh, I pose the dilemma or the problem, the conundrum, uh, uh, couched it primarily as best I could in, in using these images in terms of modern developments and challenges We've looked at, very briefly, using these images, at three inst very different institutional responses. And now let's take a look uh, at, if you will, a contextual construction of a Buddhist economic ethic. My remarks this evening will be based primarily on several contemporary Buddhist writers about Buddhist economics and Buddhist economic ethics. Uh, I'm particularly indebted to two monks with whom I worked who have been very important in terms of my own thinking. Uh, one of them is a monk by the name of Buddhadasa Bhikkhu and the other's name is P.A. Payuto. Uh, I feel very privileged to have known them personally and to have uh, studied with them. Uh, and they have very much influenced my understanding of Buddhism and particularly Buddhism and economic matters. Uh, there is, as I've already suggested, a substantial literature on Buddhist economics written by Buddhists and also scholars of Buddhism. One of the most notable, uh, and you may be familiar with it, is by the British economist E.F. Schumacher, 
whose 1973 book, Small as Beautiful, Economics as If People Mattered, has been and continues to be one of the most influential books in the field. So, uh, let's take a look then at uh, the middle way and the value of moderation. I'm sort of couching my remarks around three main topics that I think frame Buddhism and economics, or Buddhist economics, or Buddhist economic ethic. The theme of moderation, as many of you, I expect, know, know is fundamental to Buddhism. Uh, we use the word Buddhism. It's an ism word, but Buddhism does not, Buddhists do not refer to themselves using ism words. They refer to themselves as following a middle way, a majjhima patipata. This, therefore, is a way of moderation. It's an economic ethic of non-excess. The Buddhist middle way has two, as a concept, has two primary dimensions. One is philosophical, or if you will, the Buddhist worldview, which is a worldview that embraces, uh, a dyna it's dynamic, it embraces change, it embraces the notion that we are all inter causally interdependent, it rejects metaphysical absolutes on the one hand, and re it rejects nihilism on the other. Our concern, however, with, is with the other dimension, which is with the practical dimension, and the more conventional understanding of Buddhism as a middle way, which designs a moderate monastic lifestyle between the conventional life of the householder and the ascetic practices of renunciant movements that were contemporary with the time of the Buddha. So when Buddhists, or the Buddha refer, or early Buddhists referred to themselves as the middle way, it was in part to differentiate themselves from Brahmanical religion, the religion of the householder, if you will, and radical ascetical movements like the Jains or the Jains. Although this middle way, in this sense, is identified in particular with the life story of the Buddha and with the lifestyle of monks and with the, and, and with the monastic rules, it's also applicable to a general ethical code and moral values of the Buddhist tradition. P.A. Piyuto, for example, refers to the principle of moderation as the very heart of Buddhism that directs human interest toward the attainment of well-being rather than maximizing satisfaction. This is a fundamental point. The attainment of well-being rather than maximizing satisfaction. David Kalupahana, with whom I studied and taught at the University of Hawaii, describes the Buddhist path, which is referred to as the Noble, noble Eightfold Path, which is, as some of you know, the fourth of the noble truths taught by the Buddha in one of the most famous kind of summary teachings of Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. Kalupahana refers to the noble, Eightfold Noble Path as a middle way between indulgence on the one hand and self-mortification on the other. The list of the eight components of this Buddhist Eightfold Path begins with right view and right understanding. It concludes with categories that we associate with meditation, like mindfulness and concentration, but at the center, the fulcrum, if you will, of the path, we have right speech, we have right action, and we have right livelihood. Right livelihood then figures very prominently in a Buddhist economic ethic. And together with right speech and right action, they're essential components of the path, not only to economic well-being or social well-being, but it's linked to the highest level of, let's refer to it as human flourishing, the highest level of human flourishing, which, as you know, in the terminology of Buddhism, uh, is the term nirvana. So the notion of this sort of moderate ethic, if you will, which includes right livelihood, is not only important for how we live our lives in the world as economic beings, uh, but the highest level of human flourishing. Another value associated with moderation is, uh, is non-greed. In Buddhism, greed results from obsessive desires and blind attachment. Uh, there is a Pali, very famous Pali text about, we would probably refer to it as a creation story. It's about the coming of things, of coming into being of the world, if you will. What's particularly interesting for us this evening in terms of that story is that obsessive desire in this tale 
is depicted, in fact, as the intermenstru intermenstrual in instrumental cause of the decline of a natural, harmonious order of things. And there are numerous texts uh, in Buddhism, uh, in all schools of Buddhism, that, uh, that criticize un the unlimited nature of obsessive desire. And I want to share with you one story, it's a kind of funny story, uh, about um, a, pr a king by the name of Mandatu. Uh, one of the reasons why I want to refer to this story, and later on I'll be referring to another, is that uh, there's the whole issue of, of how kind of ethical teachings are conveyed in a traditional Buddhist setting. And not surprisingly, they're more often conveyed by narratives and stories uh, than they are by setting out uh, a list of principles. So here's the story. In ancient past, there lived a king named Mandatu. He was a very powerful ruler who was known for having lived a long life. Mandatu had all the classic requisites of a king. He was an exceptional human being who had everything that anyone could ever wish for. One day, after having ruled for 84,000 years, uh, in those days they ruled a long time, King Mandatu began to show signs of boredom. I should think so. <laughs> the, uh, by the way, uh, uh, a kind of subtle uh, undercurrent in this text is a criticism of kingship. The great wealth that he possessed was no longer enough to satisfy him. The king's courtiers, perceiving his disquiet, asked what was bothering him, and his majesty replied, the wealth and pleasure I enjoy here is trifling. Tell me, is there anything and anywhere superior to this. Heaven, your majesty, they replied. So King Mandatu then used his royal gem wheel that could transport him anywhere to travel to the heaven of the four great kings, the Lokapalas. The Lokapalas came out to greet him, and on learning of his desire, they must have been very generous people, invited him to take over the whole of their heavenly realm. King Mandatu ruled over the heaven for, of the four great kings for a long time, until one day he began to feel, you've got it, bored again. The pleasures from the wealth and delights of this heavenly realm no longer satisfied him. Conferring with his attendants, he was told of the superior enjoyments of Tavatimsa heaven. So King Mandatu ascended to that realm by his magical gem wheel, where he was greeted by its ruler, Lord Indra, who promptly gifted him half his kingdom. King Mandatu ruled over Tavatimsa heaven with Lord Indra for a very long time until Indra was replaced by another Lord Indra, and so on, until all 36 Lord Indras had come and gone while King Mandatu enjoyed the pleasures of his position. Finally, however, he began to feel dissatisfied. Half the kingdom wasn't enough, so he plotted to depose the reigning Lord Indra but since human beings can't kill heavenly beings, he couldn't satisfy his desire, and his craving caused him to fall down to earth, landing with a resounding thump on his head in his orchard. Some workers in the orchard improvised a makeshift throne for him, while others summoned the royal family who approached the dying monarch and asked if he had any final words. While he boasted of his great power and wealth he had possessed on earth and in heaven, he finally had to admit that his desires remained unfulfilled. Well, I think a story like that probably has some application uh, to us today, even though we wouldn't tell it in quite that way. In the view of the Thai monk, Buddha Dai, and I want to address this again, this topic in, with, with, from some other perspectives and other genre. In the view of the Thai monk, Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu, thinks of Buddhism as a middle way or a way of non-excess or moderation really in terms of a kind of philosophy of uh, the true nature of things or what he refers to as the law of nature. Nature would have each of us use, and this is a quote, uh, no more than we actually need. For years people have failed to heed the way of nature, competing with one another to take as much as they can, causing the problems that we live with to this day. If we were to take only what is enough, none of these problems would exist. The question is then, how much is enough? These days, it seems that nothing is ever enough. There's a Buddhist saying, even two entire mountains of gold are not enough to satisfy the desires of a person. What is needed is an approach that emphasizes not taking more than is needed, and that at the same time accords with the law of nature, 
for then people would share their excess out of loving kindness and compassion, two very important moral categories in Buddhism. The highest law of nature, then, is to take uh, that for ourselves, only what is needed, and to accumulate or produce beyond that for the benefit of society. For A.T. Aryaratna and the Sarvoja Ramadana movement in Sri Lanka, uh, which has conducted development projects in over 8,000 villages on the island, the Buddhist middle way translates into what Aryaratna terms a no-poverty society. Savoja rejects the goal of affluence for everyone on practical grounds. Affluence simply cannot be achieved by everybody. The world simply doesn't have sufficient resources. The social, economic, environmental, moral, and cultural costs of trying to build an affluent society are too great and would result in increasing the gap between the rich and the poor, says Arya Ratna. In the case of the Savodhya village development projects, and that is the context in which he is uh, working and writing, a no-poverty society is defined in terms of meeting 10 basic needs, and some of them would include uh, what you would expect, a clean and adequate supply of water, balanced food requirement, adequate clothing requirements, basic health care, uh, minimum en energy requirements, comprehensive education, meeting cultural and spiritual needs, and so on. Income and employment, then, in terms of Arya Ratna's philosophy of a sort of no-poverty society, work and employment are only a part. The aim of production in a village economy, his context, is not to accumulate profit, but to satisfy the needs of a community, and in doing so, to engage all members of the community in the process opportunities for work, for problem solving, for education, for learning skills, and so on. Let's now, let me now turn to my sort of second major rubric or topic uh, in thinking about Buddhism and economics, uh, consumerism, wealth, and the value of generous giving. A contemporary Buddhist economic ethic <coughs> critiques consumerism as the commodification of culture and religious values Sulakshi Warak, the Thai Buddhist social activist uh, with whom I have worked for many years and a good friend, a founder of several Buddhist NGOs, including the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, characterizes consumerism as the new demonic religion. Pracha Huntanuat, Sulak's a colleague and director of an ash one of his ashrams on the outskirts of Bangkok, contends that even many monks are obsessed with raising money from their newly rich parishioners to build every ever bigger Buddha images and superfluous religious halls. And Prapaisan Paisalo, who's a prominent monk of, in northeastern Thailand, laments the distinction between religious faith and consumerism is becoming increasingly vague these days. Nowadays, religious faith has been altered to the degree that it means purchasing auspicious objects to worship. One's faith is no longer measured by how one applies applies it or how one lives one's life, but by how many holy or sacred objects one possesses. So a critique by socially engaged Buddhists in Thailand. Contemporary socially engaged Buddhists attack consumerism as the new global religion. However, Buddhism's middle way ethic does not reject the accumulation of wealth. It does, however, establish guidelines for its acquisition and use. Wealth honestly gained is praiseworthy, but attachment to wealth, even when honestly and lawfully gained, is blameworthy, as is stinginess, not to share one's resources for the benefit and well-being of others, one's self, one's dependents, and so forth. Acquiring wealth, then, is acceptable if at the same time it promotes the well-being of all, of a community, of a society. One of the most important and praiseworthy moral values, economic values or general values, is the act of generous giving, incumbent particularly on people of means. Three basic attitudes toward wealth are central to the principle of generosity. The Pali term in Theravada Buddhism is dana. First, the concept of dana reflects the Buddhist critique of craving, hoarding, 
and accumulating too much. Secondly, Donna affirms that the amount of wealth possessed and its distribution from a moral point of view is in fact less important than the attitude that one has toward wealth and the way one uses it. Thirdly, and it follows from the second point, from a moral perspective, moral wealth has only a relative or a provisional value. Now, again, I want to refer to a story and interpret it in a somewhat complicated way in regard uh, to this particular point, uh, generosity or uh, gener generous giving uh, in, in, in Buddhist economic ethics. This is the story of a noble prince. Some of you may be familiar with the story. It's the story of Prince Vasantara, uh, next to the story of uh, the Buddha, or of Prince Vasantara, of uh, Prince Siddhartha, and his quest for Buddhahood. It is the best known story, certainly in Theravada Buddhism. As the story goes, Vasantara is a prince of the kingdom of Sivi uh, in northern India. Uh, and he gives away uh, the kingdom's white elephant that had magical rainmaking powers uh, to the people of a neighboring kingdom to help them end their drought. Well, the citizens of the kingdom were incensed by this generous act uh, because obviously it could jeopardize their own material well-being. And they called for Vasantara's banishment. Uh, so Vasantara and his family then were banished to the forest or to the jungle. Uh, one, he, he holds this great gift-giving or dana event where he gives away virtually everything, uh, but uh, his carriage and horses, which would take his family uh, into the jungle. But even that, then, is requested by a group of Brahmins who are along the roadway uh, as they're leaving the kingdom. And so he, of course, he gives that away as well uh, as, again, the logic of generous giving, if we look at it as an absolute moral principle, would require. Uh, as we might expect, uh, of course, he has his wife and his daughter, and again, as the logic of true dana as an absolute moral principle would require, soon after Vasantara and his family are in their jungle hut, the prince is asked to give up his children to be servants in the household of an old Brahmin by the name of Jujaka. And then finally, the god Indra appears in human guise and asks Vasantara for his wife. The prince accedes to the god's demand, but at this point in the story, the prince's trials come to an end. Having met this ultimate test of generosity, the sacrifice of his wife and children, it's perhaps a bit uh, like an Abraham story uh, in some respects, Vasantara's family is restored to him, and he succeeds his father as the ruler of the kingdom. Now, although Buddhists in Southeast Asia celebrate Vasantra as the epitome of the principle of generous giving, the story, as even in my brief accounting of it, uh, is apparent to all of us. It contains several moral ambiguities, not the least of which is the apparent treatment of his wife and his children as chattel. Gender, gender issues aside, however, at the story's conclusion... Vasantra is rewarded for his generous na nature and his charitable gifts. What he freely gives is returned and even multiplied. Furthermore, the readers of the story know that in his next life, Vasantra will achieve Buddhahood, which is his ultimate reward. Now, I want to suggest that even though this story celebrates generosity, we can read it in a different way. And a different reading, I would suggest, highlights the conflict between an absolute or, or an unstinting observant to an absolute moral principle, in this case, dana or generous giving, and the duties that are attendant to one's station in life. Vasantara's commitment to generous giving conflicts with his duty to fulfill his responsibilities as a head of state, as a husband, and as a father. So if we give this reading to the story, it suggests that in terms of an economic ethic, while one indeed should share generously of one's means, it should not be to the detriment of the well-being of self and others, both those near and dear as well as strangers. That is to say, 
our attitude toward and our use of goods should reflect a commitment to generosity, but a just distribution of goods should be tempered by our duties and our responsibilities in society. Let me share with you just uh, one other story. Um, again, it's about, it's about uh, a king. And uh, in this particular story, uh, the, uh, there's a tradition of kings who take care of the poor in their kingdom. Uh, but there is one king uh, who doesn't. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, stealing arises. And when a thief is caught and brought before the king, he explains that he stole since he was so poor, the king, uh, since he was very poor, so the king gives him some goods with which to support himself and his family and carry on his business and make gifts to priests and monks. Others hear of this, and then, of course, stealing increases. The king makes an example of the next thief by executing him. This then leads thieves arming themselves and killing those whom they rob so that there are no witnesses. The Buddha then sums up what amounts to a sardonic critique of royal stupidity. Thus, from not giving to the needy, poverty becomes rife. From the growth of poverty, taking what was not given increased. From the increase of theft, the use of weapons increased. And from the increased use of weapons, the taking of life increased. So I, I read this as basically making fun of kings, but the moral of the point is obvious, that rulers, or we might say elected officials, have the responsibility to provide for the material well-being of the poor, and if they don't, then they sow the, creed, the seeds of crime and social conflict. Systemic poverty threatens law and order, and thus inhibits social uh, uh, problems and personal uh, mor morality. Finally, let me turn to my last point. Uh, as we sort of frame or think about uh, Buddhism and the economy or Buddhist economic ethics, and that's right livelihood and well-being. Right livelihood denotes the Buddhist understanding of work or labor. E.F. Schumacher divides the Buddhist uh, view of work into three aspects. An opportunity to develop our human faculties, uh, an opportunity to overcome ego-centeredness by joining with others in a common task, and third, to bring forth goods and services needed for a satisfying life. For purposes of argument, I think, Schumacher draws perhaps an overly sharp contrast between modern Western economists who he contends look at work as a kind of necessary evil. For employers, he argues, labor is an item of cost to be reduced to a minimum, for workers, labor is seen as a sacrifice of one's leisure and wages as compensation for the sacrifice. Modern economics, Schumacher contends, considers consumption to be the purpose of economic activity and ties the maxim maximization of human satisfaction to an optimal power uh, pattern of consumption by the optimal pattern of productive effort. So from the standpoint of Buddhist economics, he argues, such an approach is irrational. In contrast to the modern Western economists, at least as he sees him, who measures wealth by GNP and the standard of living by the amount of annual consumption, Buddhist economics aims to gain the maximum of well-being with the minimum of consumption. Buddhist economics, he argues, postulates the essence of human flourishing, not in the multi multiplication of wants, but in the purification of human character. Uh, for Schumacher as well, uh, an economy of scale is very important. Uh, he ties uh, uh, an economy of scale, of simplicity, if you will, to nonviolence. He thinks that the two are necessarily linked. Uh, he says, as physical resources are everywhere limited, people satisfying their needs by a modest use of resources are less likely to be at each other's throats than people depending upon a high rate of use. Equally, people who live in a relatively or highly self-sufficient local community are less likely to get involved in large-scale violence than people whose existence depend on wide systems of trade. For both uh, P.A. Piuto and Schumacher, uh, uh, 
economics as a discipline is conceived in too narrowly. Uh, they want to broaden the way in which we think about economics and they coin the term meta-economics, uh, which they argue derives its objects from the study of what it means to be human in the broadest sense that includes the natural and social environments in which human beings are situated. In Piuto's view, economics has become an isolated body of knowledge, having too little to do with other disciplines or human activities. Buddhist economics, he argues, by contrast, offers a different approach, not as a self-contained science or discipline, but in fact a multidisciplinary approach working in concert with the common goal of social, individual, and environmental well-being. Finally, uh, if I can turn to just a few comments in regard to Thailand's efficiency economy. On December 4, 1997, Thailand's King Bumipo Nadunyadet made an unusual birthday address to the nation. The contents of the talk include this quote. Recently, so many projects have been impl implemented, so many factories have been built, that it was a thought, thought Thailand would become a little tiger and then a big tiger. People were crazy about becoming a tiger. Being a tiger isn't important. The important thing is for us to have a sufficiency economy, and that means enough to support ourselves. For 40 years, Thailand's economy had an average growth rate of 7.6%, one of the fastest in the world. In the early 1990s, a Japanese factory opened in Thailand every three days, and around a million people move from agricultural to urban jobs every year. But Thailand's development was from the outside and from the top down. People were involved in production and pricing systems over which they had little control. Rural debt rose relentlessly, and with it, material vulnerability and mental anxiety. While the king's speech seemed to go against the grain of this kind of development, even before Thailand's 1997 financial crisis and the collapse of the bot, there was rising concern over the destructive, divisive, unsustainable, disempowering byproducts of growth. In parts of the country, this discontent prompted support for a communist insurgency for almost 20 years. Other reactions sought more peaceful and local solutions that advocated rebuilding a sense of community and self-reliance to withstand financial so uh, shocks. Drawing on Buddhism with its stress on moderation and spiritual well-being as an antidote to the emphasis on maximizing growth and consumption, uh, building horizontal networks, pooling local wisdom, uh, relying on local initiatives, uh, rice and cattle banks, micro-saving schemes, community forest projects, self-reliant mixed farming, all of this was part of the mix. It became part of Thailand's national policy. Uh, we don't have the time to uh, explore the practical development and application of these uh, programs and principles in Thailand. Uh, there is, I think, a uh, handout that is available uh, taken from the uh, 2007 UN uh, Thailand Human Development Report on Thailand, which, uh, which talks about this at some, at some length. In, in the year 1999-2000, a working group drew up a tripartite characterization of the sufficiency economy, which I think reflects Buddhist values. Sufficiency economy is an approach to life applicable at every level. They're all interconnected, individual, family, community, nation. Secondly, it promotes a middle path in an era of economic globalization. And thirdly, it requires sound judgment in planning and implementation of development theory. The principles derived from Buddhism that are cited are moderation, reasonableness, self-immunity, wisdom and insight, integrity, perseverance, uh, and the uh, title itself in Thai, Papiang, uh, su translated as sufficiency, has this Buddhist ring. So uh, let me conclude with that, other than just to say that I think uh, this uh, philosophy of, if you will, what Schumacher referred to as Buddhist economics uh, has perhaps a, particularly, a particular reson resonance today in terms of the global economic crisis. Uh, we can, within the ambit of the Buddhist world, 
uh, find other examples which certainly resonate with this. Perhaps the best known uh, is in Bhutan, uh, the philosophy of gross national happiness, which is attributed to the king of Nupa, uh, Bhutan, a uh, philosophy that he enunciated in 1972. And in conclusion, in conclusion, then, let me make a brief tongue-in-cheek comment. Um, Namely, although the principles and policies of Buddhist economics as articulated in Thailand's efficiency economy may not be the solution to the global economic crisis, I'm hopeful that some version of it might salvage what remains of my shrinking 401k retirement account. <laughs>